Hey, shalom, guys, and welcome to Wisdom and Torah Ministries. This is what is called Witcast. It's been a while since I've done one, but I have uh, my friend Dina Dai. She's visiting from Arizona. She is free from the slavery of politics in uh, New Mexico. That's where it was, from New Mexico. She is in the real world, Florida, where you don't have to wear masks everywhere you go, and you can freely eat anywhere you want to. And we actually have a governor that actually looks out for his people. All right, so Dina, welcome to uh, my week with Cass. I'm hoping we can say something that would intrigue people. So how are you doing today? Man, I can't tell you. I you know, literally drove all the way from New Mexico right to Rico's house so we could record this with Cass. No, sure. I'm, I'm not telling the truth, but <laughs> it is so great to be in Florida. I just hope people who live in red states really appreciate what they have and that the people in Florida really appreciate it. It's really been refreshing. I feel almost restored. Spent some time at the beach, and uh, it's been a little on the cool side, but warming up. It's just uh, sort of restored my faith. <laughs> there, there is a section of the country that actually functions. Commerce is happening here in Florida in a big way. And you can pretty much go wherever you want and do whatever you want. So that means you're moving. You're coming over. Yeah, we're, uh, you know, we've been doing a little scouting. So we're converting you to Floridian. <laughs> I don't mind. I'll tell you, in the winter, it's mighty nice. I left, uh, the morning I left New Mexico was six inches of snow and the roads had not been plowed and it was... Uh, we don't have that problem no. here. So we're happy to be in Florida. So if you move, you cannot bring the weather with you. Though. I promise I won't. Well, let's get right into the... Sure. Let's get into some of the conversation we've been talking about. And, and my biggest concern is for the people that hear this, that, you know, the Bible is a political book. People don't realize that. Amen, brother. I say that all the time. I know you do. I know, because you've quoted it from uh, me. Of course, everything I know, I learned from you, exactly. don't you know? Exactly. For all the audience, everything I know, I learned from her. I mean, that's what she keeps telling everybody. Yeah. So let's agree with her for right now. But, uh, <laughs> no, but seriously, um, what we want to do is talk a little bit about the the involvement or what should what should we as believers what should be our approach because what I notice in America that believers whether they call themselves you know Christians or Messianics or Hebrew roots regardless we believe in the God of creation and even the regular Jewish people they believe in the God create the God of creation. Um, but I seem, Dina, and you are a Jewish background, so you, you you know born Jewish home. So the Jewish people have a very unique approach to life. Everywhere they've been scattered, they have become an active members of society, and they've become very influential in every every part of life. And I think uh, the model biblically is to to become be planted somewhere and bear fruit in. Correct me if I'm wrong, but what I see the last 40 years is that the whole Christian people have removed themselves from the from the arena of of society. They have isolated themselves, uh, become more of an echo chamber, just listening to themselves without them becoming an influence on the real world. Now we have a problem 30 years later in which the educational system has really gone down the drain in the systems of um, education in schools and universities. And now the only people running or they are in office are liberals who have no values that we hold dear. And they're attacking our values. Not only our democracy and our republic, but also the values, which is more important than the republic and the democracy. So w what are your views about that within one minute? I'm kidding. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, you know, the Jewish community is always, when it's moved into a new environment, Culturally, they get very involved. Um, they work their way up into the sort of the political system or the, the the religious system or whatever, and they they do engage. The problem is they usually end up assimilating. Yes. They don't have. There's not the sort of demarcation. Be separate but engage. I think this is our biggest struggle here. How do you engage but how do you remain separate? And the the Christian community's done the opposite. So the Jewish community tends to assimilate, and you can't really tell the difference. And the Christian community tends to isolate, and and sometimes also assimilate. I mean, it's sort yeah. of this dichotomy. And I think this is the biggest question we have facing us: is how are we going to walk through this, where we are disengaged from that from that culture, that sewer culture that we're looking at, but at the same time. We don't remove and isolate ourselves, but we still have a mission 
to go forward and spread the, the gospel to the four corners of the earth. So let me ask you in regards to that. I do, you know, we do a lot of contextual, cultural background things. And one of the things that I finally realized is, you know, that preaching the gospel is not standing on the pulpit and preach the gospel. Preaching, preaching the gospel biblically is to do exactly what we are trying to ask people to do, become actively involved in your community by showing the character of God. I mean, um, what's his name? Um, Vanderland. He made a... a, a, a yeah, he made a, a very, very good teacher. Yes. And I have a lot of his stuff. And one thing that I use now that he actually presented one of his teachings that really resonated with me. He says, we are put here to put God on display, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. through our action. That Israel's job was to put God on display. And that really makes sense to me. It's like, I get it. So when I yes, look at now... The Hebrew people were supposed to show what God is doing in the world. Through them. Exactly. But if we're not becoming part of active, actively becoming, making a difference, because right now, for example, we have abortion. Let's take abortion. You know, I mean, that's nothing new. The Romans were experts in aborting babies, you know. And in the ancient world, they used to do uh, sacrifice to sacrificing children to people, I mean, to, to gods. Uh, what's the difference? And now we have the same thing that Pharaoh did, mm -hmm. killing the children at birth, yep. Yep. is the same thing is happening now. It's interesting, too, that we're in the season uh, reading the, uh, the show. Exodus, yeah. Yeah, and, we, and we've co we're covering that. And I, I was really struck by that when I was reading, a, 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 excuse me, Shemot chapter 1. You know, we, I was thinking, what, what happened to the community? Because we only know about Moses. The focus is on yeah. Moses. And I'm going, okay, we know other baby boys were thrown into the river and drowned. Culturally, what happened to Israel as their children were being murdered? We, and what happened to the community? And did the community not grow because it had removed the seed, you know, the mm -hmm. males? And, and I, we were in a Bible study, and I was sort of, my mind just kind of wandered off and thinking, we don't really know what the consequences were in yeah. the community of that of that of the death of those baby boys. I mean, right now we have a sense of in the reverse in China when they killed the all the, the, all, all, the, the all the girls, yeah. and now they have a very limited amount of girls. Now some women they see power in that in the negative sense. I was listen. I was reading some news on that that there are some women, especially if they're really attractive, that they, attra they attract many high-level rich men. Sure. And they're not committed to one because they know now that they can gain a lot of money, position, and power based on their sexual because there's not enough good-looking Chinese women. But you, know? you also end, with a, uh, end up with a brutish culture. Absolutely. Because yeah. women are the civilizing influence in a marriage on, on men to kind of tamp down what could be just yeah. in, insane, intense behavior. So you uh, all that culturally in China, you know, yeah. it ha that's the thing. There, there are grave consequences to when we violate God's order of, of bringing forth life. So, so the mandate of creation, um, it, it, I find it interesting that everything that God put on uh, uh, on the earth to reveal who He is uh, has been slowly eroding and now escalating in this country to a pace. That I've never seen. Oh, it just takes your breath away when you. I mean, just in in a very in very short order, and now we're seeing it just steamroll. And my question has often been, like, where's the bottom? Where do we reach the bottom? Is there? I mean, is this just free fall? And I, we, the people of God, are the only ones that can stop this and turn it around. But and we won't. Well, we're we're scared of political correctness. Yeah. And uh, Dina, my my biggest worry is is that we, if I make a statement on Facebook, Instagram, whatever, in which I'm presenting values that we, as a Torah teacher that we are, we Torah teachers, that we hold and we live by and we believe. The thing is, it's not the unbeliever who's attacking me. Now is the believers, people that I thought were on the same boat, going in the same direction. Nothing surprised me. See, surprises me because in the wilderness, also in the Shemot uh, Exodus story, we see them wanting to go back to Egypt anyway. So that's been a little bit shocking to me because I'm a little naive in thinking that 
well, we're supposed to all go to the kingdom. So, uh, you know. And everything's great. But what I found is my biggest enemies are not the people outside. But that's always the case. You go back in history, back to where the enemy is inside the camp. Working yeah. its way up. The I would suggest, yes, and I would even suggest going back to, quote, the garden, you know, the serpent. Was Adam there. allowed the serpent, and we can argue over who that is, but Adam allowed an enemy inside the camp, and that enemy Speak began, in somebody's ear. Yeah, working inside the camp outwards, and so that, that principle comes to bear. I mean, you can see that That's all true. through history. Because it, the churches now, they're so liberal. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really incredible how people, well... People want itchy, they have itchy ears anyway. And it doesn't surprise me. I've been this past year, I decided, and you, 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 in part, you were a little bit of an inspiration on that because not that it's necessarily good, <laughs> but, <laughs> but what you did made me aware. And then talking to Josh Tolley, have you talked to Josh Tolley before? I have. Yeah, Josh Tolley's a very bright man, extremely smart. We we're having a conversation, and he was talking about finances and the kingdom. and why can't believers be entrepreneurs? You know, and why can't we? Uh, you as a Torah teacher cannot have your own business aside from from you know from ministry. And he he opened my eyes in that in that sense that we he says something. He goes in the twenties or the eighteen hundreds or the Bible they were all entrepreneurs, and that's so true. And then in after World War Two, they became employees. Well, if you parallel that to the gospel and the way it's been preached, whatever, we're no longer self-sufficient in, 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 in understanding certain biblical principles. We are so con this, we are so depending on a one leader. So we flow on the same vein of that leader, even if he is if he's completely out of his mind, we put our faith in that leader. And that is true also in politics. Yes. And I think I think the day too is coming quickly. Because we are going to have to disengage from this culture. There is no oh, if and I'm already buts. disengaging big right. time. So people are bit by bit pulling themselves back from big tech or, you know, shopping for uh, certain uh, corporations that don't, you know, we don't agree with or have, you know, in some way uh, criticized where we're at as a, we the people. And so uh, we're th we are fast moving to that place to where we're going to have to figure out how to engage one another, how to create businesses within one another, yeah. how to shop Christian business owners, all that stuff is coming. We are going to have to operate underground like they do in China because right. the same corporate authoritarianism surveillance state is coming here. It's, it's already here. Yeah, just um, not in the fullness of I have a piece of China. land. Yeah. I have a piece of land, and um, my buddy Gabriel, he's my neighbor, he's a pastor, and we decided to facilitate a piece of our land for the local community to have like a little garden. We're going to have like little spots, you know, three by nine, three by seven, six feet or whatever. So they can do, uh, you know, their own uh, vegetables and trying to buy for one another. For example, I need a job done. So I call the people in the community to create an, a, to create a, an, an economy within the kingdom. It has to, we ha this is where we're headed. But we're not doing that. Well, we're, we're going to be forced to do it. Right. It may not be here right now, but I can already see the structural elements coming into place. Like what you're doing here, we're doing back in New Mexico. We have a fairly large community. And I've already been kind of talking to everybody. Let's pool our resources. Who's able to do what? Who can do what? How, you know, how can we grow food? How can we buy from one another? I mean, I just learned the other day that down the road for me is a, is a ranch, you know, slaughters animals, and we can buy our meat there. So we're, this is going to have to happen everywhere. And this is what I tell people. This is, we're no longer in, you know, Lone Ranger yeah. faith anymore. We're going to have, we are going to be forced to come together and work as a team because that's the only way we're going to survive this. That is true. I, I, I also believe that we need to know each other's gifts. Uh, and yes. Sukkot, Sukkot, we were talking about that. Yeah. That's one of the biggest focus I try to, you know, we need to develop an econ economy within the kingdom. We need to know what gifts you bring to the table. Yep. For example, it happened to me this weekend. Um, I had some job I need to do. My buddy's an electrician. So I gave the job to him. And I don't know anything about electricity. I mean, to right. be an electrician. Yeah. But I know about self-defense. I know about, uh, uh, you know, all the things away from Torah. Yeah. You know, that I, I think I could bring to the table. So what I'm doing in my personal walk is 
developing those those gifts and those attributes and bring it to the table. So we, if ha we, have, to. we have to do that. But we don't talk to each other enough exactly. because we're arguing about petty doctrinal differences. I think this is the, I think that's just all going to melt away out of pure need and desperation. Isn't that maybe what the kingdom needs yeah. in order to grow? Yeah. I mean, well, we know, you know, the kingdom grows in persecution. It grows when you're in the vice grip of the crucible of God. Right. And so that's where we're headed. And and we can, you know, get frustrated over it, but it looks to me like by design and on purpose, God is is going to, in some ways, force his people to work together uh, to build the kingdom in a way they had not previously thought. Because we are not fiefdoms unto ourselves. And that we have become ministries and, and unto ourselves. If you see what's happened to the church, it's become a giant corporation and giant business. That's that true. was never what God intended. Yeah. And these businesses, these church businesses, have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. And they are, I And don't they've believe, been very silent the last year. They haven't said anything. Yeah. And, yeah, they're fear. Now they're a fear of losing their, their little kingdoms. That's really what it right. is. Right. And what is it, the bottom line? They're, f they're fearful of losing their money. Yeah. So we can't walk in that kind of fear anymore. You know what really encouraged me um, in the Torah portion last week? I was doing a uh, teaching in Spanish, and I also did it in English on Facebook. It encouraged me greatly to know that although Israel, they always rebel and they challenge God's authority. But the Lord told Aaron, he told Moses, hey, take an omer of manna, mm -hmm. and I want you to put that as a testimony in the Holy of Holies and inside of the ark. And I had like four people ask me the same question. Well, Rico, if the tabernacle was not built yet, then why is that all about? And they forget that the, the, the Torah has, was written after the event. Moses is relating the story right. about what happened and then what, what God told him to do with it. But the whole story encouraged me because I said, I told my wife, I said, isn't it amazing how the Lord, although Israel disobeys, he's still committed to provide for you, yes. even in the wilderness. Even when you want to go back to Egypt, he still says, I want you to, to know that my commitment to take care of you and provide for you. Well, now we're about to find out. We are about if to find out for sure. Do we trust him to do that or not? Absolutely. And that's... This past year, uh, like any ministry, we all worry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because it, we're human beings. Mm -hmm. And when COVID came, um, I don't travel. I've been more, I've been, I've had more Shabbats. And I'm not complaining, okay? But I have spent more Shabbats this year than the last 10 years combined and that to me is amazing but at the same token before i would have been afraid because I'm, i don't have a place to go minister right now we're grateful for the internet in a way because that's still able to stay in touch with people but to honor the lord and to give him praise you know although i have not been traveling we have never had a, 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 a lack the Father has given us what we needed. And the Lord has totally provided. I mean, I've had my days. Don't get me wrong. Well, we all do. Perfect, we all do. You know? But I have found, like my husband, for example, had a season where his business was kind of blah, blah, blah. And mine yeah. was just taken off. I mean, I was traveling and speaking and selling my books. And then the virus hit and the exact opposite happened. His business is booming. And, you yeah. know, I'm, I mean, I'm grateful people are still supporting the ministry. And, and uh, you know, I have been speaking somewhat. But th this is, we're at that D-Day moment. Uh -huh. Just exactly how far are we going to trust him? Are we well, <clears throat> my opinion in regards to the situation that we are about to go into, I know famine is coming. Yes. You know, you have Bill Gates and Bezos, Be uh, what's his name, Bezos? Bezos, yeah. Bezos, Bezos buying, Bezos is number four in America and Gates is number one. Yeah. Owning all of the farm land, land the, best. the best farm yeah. land. Now we have one guy who computer a computer dude who wants to vaccinate everybody for population control, and this is not a conspiracy. This is a fact. Yeah. Okay, and he's also buying all of the farmland. Yeah. No, Why? There's, yeah, there's no question. I do find I I always as an aside find it interesting that the the biggest complaint the gods had back in you know we go back to the ancient Sumerian uh -huh. culture was overpopulation. This is not amazing. That was true in the ancient world too. Exactly. Yeah, we're going back, what, 7,000 so 7, 7, years, years ago, they were complaining. Yeah. The gods 
Those in control, yeah. those are the power structure we're complaining about overpopulation. Hey, by the because way, we they had to feed people. That's right. Well, we have to. By the way, we're going to create humanity. This is what they believe. We're going to create human humans so they can be our slaves and take care of the elite, it's, take care of the gods. It's, it's the same thing. We we're right smack. I mean, nothing has changed. That's what I try to tell people. I mean, the that's the foundation of the Bible is the ancient world. Yeah. And so what was so unique about Israel is they were not slaves. That God, right. you know, people. provided for them. They didn't have to go work in the fields for the gods to grow, you know. They were businessmen. Exactly. And raised up that way. So um, So what so the question would be um, how can we handle a government that clearly is against every single value that we hold dear and i gotta tell you i got i gotta be straight up beyond political affiliations okay i don't look at the i don't look at the candidate for the party that i like to be my candidate because th this is the thing that really bothers me about spiritual people okay and i've been a teacher a long a long time here so i guess maybe i could have an opinion on this what bothers me is that we measure our leaders based on their charisma mm -hmm. or based on what they say to you the way they the way that you want to hear it. Bingo, yeah. And we don't look at their values. No, never. So and we cannot accept the fact that someone tells us something the way we need to hear it. Not the way we want to. The way we need to hear it. Straight up, right through the you know, to the point. And we cannot see a righteous act from maybe an unrighteous person. Example, drug addicts, I'm sorry, cartel leaders. These guys, they build cities for their communities. They build schools. They give a lot of money. But they're wicked. But in the middle of all that, they gain the favor of the people right. because they've done righteous act, exactly. although they're wicked in their own behavior. Yeah. And we don't know how to identify. So now we have one who pretends to be a nice dude he looks nice but he is endorsing every wicked behavior that we abhor according to the torah so how can you support that affiliation well and people end end up fixated on the personality and yeah. of the person instead of the policies of the person now if you're repeat going that to, again that was good people end up focused and impressed by the personality of whoever is running for office or serving as in, as leadership versus the policies. Right. It's the policies that matter with character. Right. And so if you have uh, insulated and isolated yourself from your community and now some guy comes along or gal comes along and they're going to run for office, what do you know about them? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. Because you've removed yourself out of your own community. I mean, there's a re the whole design of our government is so that you can engage at the very basic level, like dog catcher, if you needed to. Right. The closest uh, off officials to who you are in your community, you need to know who they are. You need to go to town council meetings, and you need to know every one of your town councilors. So when the time comes up and a particular issue comes up, and how they vote, and and to have engage and have a relationship with them so that when that time comes they can actually listen to you. Right now we know that our officials don't listen to anybody. No, they don't. You know, so they're you, not accountable to anybody. You call up, you write a letter, you send an email, and I'm not saying don't do that, but you are so far removed from who your representative is, they could care less. Well, it's easy to, to hit delete on an email of someone you don't know. Exactly. Oh, I didn't get it, you know. Exactly. I mean, so that requires everybody in whatever community that they live in to know the people well beyond just elections, but to, you know, take them out for coffee, you know, call them up on the phone and have a conversation, know them. And so that when they run for office or, you know, you either know whether you're going to support them or not, or that you would have influence. Well, but the problem is the notion that there's a notion that believers should not be involved. Oh, I know. In, in anything in your community because we are the kingdom of God. We're just waiting for Messiah, so the hell with everybody else. Um, and I think there's a mistake. Huge mistake. And it's the reason we are where we are. Right. Because back in the early 20s uh, and the 30s and even the 40s, there were many people in politics who had values. Maybe they're not living a life uh, completely the way 
that we would expect them to live, but they have they have certain values. But you go back, you know, the first century. Yeah. I mean, go look in, in uh, Asia Minor. The leaders of those communities, the political leaders of those communities, were Jews. Mm, that's true. Okay, and the ecclesia was a political entity. It, it wasn't. Yeah. You know, it's not it was a religious. That it was this way. Right. And so I think, uh, really, in the um, the time of the Enlightenment is when things kind of separated to where you have your box, your you know your your religious box, and then you have your your political box, and they separated, and so the religious were pushed back into the religious box, you know, on the right. back burner. And there was a huge divide between sort of religion and science, if you will. And I think that's probably the, the, the point, the inflection point to where we have this vast separation. And now we've compartmentalized, compartmentalized our lives. Mm -hmm. We have our spiritual life, and then we have the rest of it. You know? Yeah, we don't realize that my daily life. It's like I remember when I was reading by John Walton's book, and he was talking about worth-ship. Mm -hmm. Worship is actually your worth as a person. You know, we worship God by the behavior that we convey to the people. If people see us eating clean, they'll ask you, why, why do you do that? And then you're able to praise God and give honor to your patron by the testimony of whom you serve. And we forget that our worship is actually our behavior. You know, it's not just singing solo songs right. like everybody thinks. Right. And um, it's, I, I find it so incredibly disturbing that we as believers, we are so much, we, we care so much about Israel. We do. Mm -hmm. About being the kingdom of God. Absolutely. But we forget that we have been planted. We've been scattered as the seed of Abraham to bear fruit so people from the nations can see that the fruit of the tree that comes from God is good and that maybe I want to serve your God or maybe I want you to lead us. That's the only way people are going to come to, to God is by seeing other people in action. But we don't have that right well, now. Well, I mean, you can't, uh, and you know, I started on fire prayer ministry, um, but it was about praying and doing. So we had, I gave out marching orders every week for prayers, but I also within that gave marching orders for every week. This is what you need to do. Yeah. They go hand in yeah, hand. Absolutely. I mean, that to me is the, the concept, I know I was reading a book recently talking about the concept of faith, and it tends to be a little abstract, but in many cases in the New Testament, it's re referring to allegiance, our yeah. allegiance to, to, God, the, yeah. to God, you know, as the king over uh -huh. the kingdom. Right. But that that allegiance must, works must accompany that allegiance. Faith it, without works is dead. nothing. Well, yeah. they understood what, a, okay, the biggest problem that we have today that goes along with what you just said, is they understood what an oath meant. That's why the confession of faith is structured as an oath. Right. You know, if you confess with your mouth that Yeshua is your master, yeah. and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. When they made that confession, it is binding. It's an oath. Yeah, it's not just sort of a random comment. It's yeah, well, it's yeah. like, for example, people say the Shema all the time. Mm -hmm. And they don't realize that the Shema is a confession. It's, a, it's an oath of loyalty, yes. allegiance yes. to the God of Israel that you're not going to worship anything else. So we don't have the oath of allegiance in the United States. Right. Some of the council members don't even know it. Right. So the Constitution is not going to have any value. Well, which, I think if we forget that this is, the, this is a governmental entity, the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. It's not a religious entity. Yeah, but stop there because... That's the argument that people cannot handle. Yet we have a, I agree with you, but that's the argument. People don't realize that in Israel you had a high priest, you had a king, you had judges, you had, but but within the Hebrew roots or within the Messianics, you know, with some, some circles, now I can't say all of them, but they don't respect the order of the kingdom of God. How will they respect the order of your country or have any value to speak if you don't really understand the structure of God's kingdom? So, yeah, and so, you know, I, I don't see them as separate things. I mean, I, you know, I am a, a kingdom citizen, you know, I have my uh, kingdom assignment in the, in the Torah, I give my allegiance to the king of the kingdom, mm -hmm. but he has planted me on planet Earth in right. a community, uh, and uh, my job as a kingdom citizen is to make life better for those around me. That's well, my call is to 
make their lives better, to improve their lives in whatever way I am able to do that. Well, doesn't the Bible say that we are ambassadors? Yeah. The New Testament, yeah, Paul says that. Absolutely. That we are now a new creation, mm -hmm. and by default, we become ambassadors of the message. The good news, hey guys, death no longer has any reign over us for eternity. By the way, if you die before return of Messiah, don't worry. You've been sealed by His Spirit. You, re he, he, you belong to God. Uh, in the meantime, if you sleep, you will be resurrected. Uh, he promised, right? And by the way, don't you know that we are ambassadors? Once I, I remember I was... And that ambassador, I mean, you are a representative of the king. And you speak on his behalf. Exactly. I remember when I went to uh, South Africa for the first time. And I was in awe how beautiful it is. I was just, wow. The sun and the, the scenery, it was incredible. And I'm sitting at the airport, and I'm thinking, Lord, I can't believe you brought me all the way to South Africa. You know, and I felt in my heart, it's like, well, yeah, you're an ambassador. I'm not saying God was speaking to me. I'm just, I was thinking yeah. about what the Bible says, and I'm thinking, I'm an ambassador of my king. Yeah. I better and be on point. What was the heart of the king? It was to take, of, of our king was to take care of the least of these right. and make their lives better, the widows and the orphans and those who had no voice. What a message. Huh? That's our... That's our message. It's our message. Helping those people in need, a righteousness and justice, and the, the foundation of God's throne. And, and so when we remove ourselves from that and it's like we four and no more and we sit in our, you know, ivory yeah. tower churches drinking our lattes in the back, you know, back row, I mean, we, we're, yeah. we're completely missing the boat, I think. And that's why I don't separate... Um, my responsibility in my community in real time and if that's you know if you want to call it political that's what I do but at the same time I'm a kingdom ambassador and I'm you know I'm gonna fight for those babies you well, know, me I'm, too I wrote I mean I wrote scathing letters to some of my representatives because New Mexico's ready to remove all the guardrails from our what the abortion law we have to where it's a free-for-all you know so, but, but that's that's incredible when I hear about it, because the moral decay of a nation now is passing on the buck on the innocent. Yeah. They yes. are basically letting the innocent pay exactly for the behavior, right. for the immoral behavior of the nation. Abortion, right. Too. So that's dangerous. Let me. That leads me to another point, which may be a little controversial. Well, because you're a woman, so I can bring it up here. All right. So. Now we can't say woman or woman or man or whatever stupid, ridiculous Pretty soon political. We won't be able to say anything, but right? guess what? We're going to say it. And that, let me just say this <laughs> for the record: <laughs> quit using their language. Right. Whenever you just fall into the trap and use the language of the left, you've just given them power. So yeah. take back your words. That's and, right. And call Ooh, things as they are. That's right. Amen. <laughs> right. <laughs> Amen, a woman. What an idiot. I'm sorry. That got to be so stupid. All right. So leads me to the whole thing on uh, your president. He, he's, if only you guys were here to see her look. <laughs> I have to do that. Would you please read my T-shirt? I know. I know who's still your president. All right. So, you guys are missing out on my T-shirt. I know, right? I have a silhouette of Donald Trump, and it says, still, still my, my president. president. <laughs> okay. He's still the one. <laughs> All right, so Just that's funny. So okay, so he, uh, the new one, the guy who's there now, we're not going to mention his name. Um, he signed an executive order for women, for transgenders to compete in women's in sports. Oh right, yeah, that one too, and in the military. True, but the morale in the, in the military is going to decay. But let's talk about well, let's talk about sports because I play baseball well, professionally. Well, it's pretty well over. Uh, as far as I can see, women don't exist. Okay. Let me bring the other side of the coin now. This is what feminism has brought to the oh, table. No okay, so now we've been fighting for equality, right? Equality. We want equality. Okay, fine. So now don't complain that a man who now feels he's a woman, has that they give him the right to go compete in women's sports. And then you complain that he's a man, but you defend him that he can choose whatever he wants. We are come to the point that we have totally lost our minds. So if you want equality from what? Because, you see, this is something that I've been researching lately, right? Well, see, that's the, this whole equality is like a god, and it comes out of the French Revolution, excuse me. Yes. I'd rather go back to the American Revolution. True. Um, it, it's but, not about making everything the same. 
equality has become uniformity. Right. And that's not possible. Exactly. So it goes back to what the Bible really uh, tells us. I treat you with dignity and honor, but we have distinct roles. And, and those roles have function and purpose. Yes, and that's what these people don't get. Right. So when uh, on Facebook someone was complaining about that particular law, and I said, I agree with you that it's not fair for the women to now have to compete with some guy who thinks now he's a woman. Right. Okay, because he was born a male. All right, fine. But, but this is what feminist movement gets because they want to have equality, not in roles, uh, in roles. Okay? Well, that's what they say they want, but they really want control. True, but what I'm saying is that now they are now they're paying the price oh, no because question. now they're saying, "Well, he has the strength of a man." Yeah, dummy, he is a man. <laughs> he can, you cannot compete with the strength of the male. Doesn't mean that women doesn't have the capacity to do many greater things that men can do. I can't give birth. Well, genetically, I can't. But even if I could, for crying out loud, I mean, how would that be? You guys go to such pain threshold that we 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 get. Was, we get a nail thing and we were crying, when you know? When men are sick, it's just... <laughs> you were like, baby, it's, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true, I admit it. it. Is, yeah. It's true, so. but so now that, that right there gives us an example of how society have lost... And by the way, the problem is that many believers are endorsing this stuff now. We got pastors from pulpits oh, yeah. endorsing... Look at the guy from Georgia. Yeah. He, he, he's supposed to be a reverend. He won! Right. And he won. Imagine, what does that say about the people? Oh, wait a second. We voted for him because he's black and we're black. Well, it doesn't matter what color you are. What values and character does he have? Yeah. It and doesn't matter will, about yeah. ethnicity right. and ethnicity. And that will reflect, reflect your policies. Right. Your value, your character, all of that, uh, your policies in the marketplace will be influenced by your character. Well, it's isn't that the way it is with us as teachers? Yeah. I mean, what, what allows us to do our job is the calling of God in our lives, but the greater responsibility to live according to the standards that God has set. Yeah. If we don't live according to those standards, then anyone can come and say, we're not going to listen to you. You're not accountable. So why don't we do that in the everyday life and politics? Because we no longer have those values. Yeah. And we're not speaking out. Now, but we've done it with Facebook and we've done it now with Newsmax and Fox and the other things. Oh, we no, we've seen the direction you're going. So we're tuning out. We're not supporting you. Wait, wait, wait. How come you don't do that with your politicians who they get caught in some, you know, indecency well, or corruption? It's, it's selective. It's That's what I'm saying. Selective bias. So it's a hypocrisy. Uh, well, and, and, you know, one political party in particular, although we could probably put both of them in there, but the... The hypocrisy, uh, it, the ability to not to choose not to recognize your hypocrisy is uh, foundationally a Marxist thing. True. That was in their the tenets of Marxism was you could compartmentalize so that you didn't have to deal with your hypocrisy because really we've come down to a place where everything. I mean, you can't we can't have a discussion about anything where we don't see the hypocrisy of it. You know, I put both parties in it, and yeah, now I I, I no longer I have a tough time believing in this government now. Oh, yeah, I. There's no justice, and my biggest concern is what people don't realize that that wall in the southern in the southern border was actually keeping child trafficking to a minimum. Oh, and I live in a, a border state, right. so I know all about it. However, I just read today, and I. I don't know if we want to date ourselves here, but uh, the the current administration pulled back from that suit. It's not going the the Supreme Court's not going to hear the executive order on the on the uh, border wall. What does they're that mean? That they're not going to support it? No, it means the administration is not going to advance that position anymore. Oh, because so they, it got scarce, you know, yeah. the caravans coming from yeah. all, they, you know. They backed off, so I mean, a, a somewhat of a victory. Yeah, but, but it's but the problem is that Americans did not have. Yeah. The, the they didn't have the time to research enough to know really what's going on. Well, so that's, you know that I, I, when you were talking earlier, it occurred to me. So we're teachers, and the one thing that we, I mean, obviously our character matters, and we do what we can. You know, mm -hmm. mano y mano with God to try to you know uh, build our characters and be uh, respectful and responsible. But one of the requirements of our 
job is to study and research, which we do seven, eight, ten hours a day. Pretty sometimes. much. Yeah. Okay. What? Why wouldn't we take that same desire to study and research for our country? And understand our government and how it works and what our responsibility is and what we can do to make things better. Like somehow we just go, well, I'll just make a phone call and that'll be kind of it. Well, well that's, it goes back to what we were saying earlier. We not really engage um, because we, we, we've lost our mandate. We got to remember, when we come to tour, right, we're wounded little kids. Oh, they lie to us. They lie to us. They lie to us. Then we study Torah long enough, and we go to the wrong sources. Hislop, hint, hint, hislop. And then after 10 years, oh, they lie to us again. Now we don't trust anybody. Right. So the option is, let's go back to church, or let's just get bitter. Let's not talk to anybody. Let's go to the mountains and hide, you know, and not become active in a society that God put us here for. And after I heard that teacher by, by Vanderland, I realized, wow, um, I have it. God's given me a great opportunity to really put him on display. And I think it's made me realize that I have to be more active in my community and speak out a little bit more about the values that we hold. And my, uh, my support for a leader, because every country has leaders, and it would be ridiculous to say that we're not going to support the well-being of our country, right. although we are kingdom citizens, yeah. but we live in this country. It's chaos. Yeah, but the mindset it. of the people thinking that, well, I live in the kingdom of God. I don't care where I live. Then you can't complain. Right. Well, then that's that compartmentalization of your religious life and your regular. So what the, So then if we're going to separate it the way you're saying. Well, with I everything, don't think it, it should be separate. I know what yeah. I'm saying, but if we're going to do that, then, yeah. um, then why does God have us here for what are we? How useful are we? We're supposed to be his kingdom to work for him, but we're not doing anything for his... Oh, but we know all the names, and we can argue about theology. Well, at the very... I mean, for me, now this is just my opinion, but honestly, I mean, the very heartbeat of God is life. The very, you know, center of Genesis 1 going forward is, you know, the coming together of two parties and producing life, and that life is the seed that will, you know, travel on etern eternally. And so if we don't, at the very least, defend life, I don't know what on earth we're here for. Personally, I have a problem anybody calling a believer, themselves a believer and supporting a, supporting a leader who blatantly comes out and supports not only the murdering of children, but also donating my tax money for other countries to have abortions? That's despicable. And anyone who says believe in the God of Israel and believes in Yeshua, the Messiah, should be ashamed of themselves. Oh, because they're victims, and now they don't like the guy who had the, the orange hair because he told you things that way you don't want to hear. But at least, maybe he didn't, you didn't like his personality. Maybe you didn't like the way he told you something. But when it came to uh, certain values that we hold valuable according to the Torah, he held them dear. Compared to the other guy who never came out of the basement, who told you what you wanted to hear, and now he is, he is supporting murder every day. And, 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 and all kinds of crazy things, human trafficking and things like that. I'm, I'm very disappointed. I'm very disappointed in the way we've be, we have, you know, like uh, handled this situation. Because we have lost our stinking minds thinking that if I support this leader, it has nothing to do with his personality cult. It has to do with values. And the policies that are enacted. Right. For the benefit of its members of, for the benefit of all society. I, there's a great quote I, li I like to use. Conservatives, Christians, fight until they lose. Leftists fight until they win. And so we're guilty of, we don't have long range view. We're not willing to be in it for the long haul. You know, I think of- Muslims like, are. Yeah. But, but the Christians communists are. are not. You think about, I think about a guy like William Wilberforce who was single-handedly responsible for ending the slave trade in Britain, and he worked at it for 25 years, day in and day out, in Parliament. He was, you know, he was a member of Parliament. He spoke out, and he worked it, worked it, worked it. He had failure after failure after failure until three days before he died. Finally, they passed a, a law to overturn the slave trade. Are we willing to do that? Are we, we willing to go 20 years 
working day in and day out, it's like some people have in the trenches for on behalf of the unborn, the right to life and operation rescue and all these ministries that have worked tirelessly. We need to be doing that. Well, child trafficking, women trafficking is I mean, right now the no and, and it bothers me because we are I always said that ministry begins in your home. And I've always measured a leader by the type of family he has. Not by what he does, how much schooling or whatever. And for me personally, that was the deciding factor in my support for the previous president. And in my complete disdain for the one that's there now. Because the chaos in his family, you know, and compared to the other family. And no family is perfect, by the way. No. But no family is perfect, but that's the one thing I told my wife. I said, you got to look at this guy. He was uh, a billionaire. And by the way, if you don't, if you guys don't like the wit, ca wit cast that we're doing today because it's not, you know, over spiritual the way you want to hear it, you can send all the emails to Dina and tell her. Thank you very much. And I will forward them on to Rico. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think that we have to come out of our boxes and face reality. Yeah. And I told my wife, I said, look at his family. I, I've been following this guy since he was in the 80s. And we all know he was a billionaire who was a womanizer. Right. I mean, we that was no secret. Great businessman. But then I began to pay attention to the family. Yeah. And I told my wife, okay, fine. He has a history. I've also been through a divorce. He's been through a divorce. You know, but I'm blessed that my family functions well because the Lord had brought order. And then I, I told her, watch the family. No major that we know of. No major stuff. And they've looked. You know, and I'm thinking, oh, yeah. and, and look, an right? And look, and look at how it goes, yeah. Yeah. and look how they're behaving. Uh, whatever, they're not perfect. I'm not saying that, but at least you can see that there is some kind of an order. Whatever you feel about the leader is irrelevant. But they still got the family, because that says a lot about the leader. Oh, it absolutely does. And I'm always sort of confused because, honestly, pretty much every president we've ever had has been a womanizer. <laughs> right? Just look at Kennedy. One of the best presidents. How about and, Roosevelt? I mean, yeah. take your pick of the ones we actually know. So I, I have. I think every leader, even in the yeah, Bible. Yeah, yeah. This is quite common. So I mean, kind of give me a break on that one. But I, I, again, I go back. It's not about a personality. It's about a policies and the policies that were implemented in the previous four years brought blessing to the nation. Mm -hmm. uh, were we perfect? Were we still screwed up? We, yeah, I yes. get all that. But I mean, just on protecting the unborn. I mean, not one president in the history of the United States ever went right. since we Roe v. Wade and spoke at the March for Life. That's right. You know, we never saw that. And the work done in sex trafficking, unbelievable. Like, you know, the fruit is still being borne by right. what that administration's done. Just for us in border states with the wall, you know, protecting the country. Well, they're and very they're protected in D.C. right now. Yeah. Oh, well, very protected in D.C. right now. National Guard troops, yeah. Right, and no walls reason. all around. They want to make them higher. But I thought walls don't work. Isn't that racist? Yeah, it is. So that means that D.C. is racist against all of us, the citizens who are trying to actually pay their... Don't get me started. I, I won't. But, you know, I, I mean, we had a period of time in which every community was blessed. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I understand, you know, everything's corrupt. However, the black community is doing really well. Yeah. Uh, the Hispanic community yeah, was course. just taken off. So... Those policies blessed everyone and, and enabled people to, to, to do well. And, and I mean, we, we could talk all afternoon, but now we've shifted 180 degrees. I mean, the first thing out of the gate is the destruction of the Keystone Pipeline and the potential loss of 63,000 jobs. You know, the opening up of our border so that now illegals can come in and take the jobs. Crazy. I mean, it's just on and on. I, I, you know, I, I'm trying not to. We're just trying to get you to see that it matters who your leader is. It matters what, you know, their character and out of their character, how they implement policy. Right. It matters. And so we need to, um, we need to support those. If that, my son will do what the son of the president is doing, I mean, I'll be held to high accountable accountability. Yeah. And as a leader, I will lose a lot of credibility. Just because they're saying, where does that come from? Oh, well, we know that not all the kids behave the way their parents do. Some sure. are good, some behave. I understand. But even then, I remember the time that you look at a kid and the way he behaved. The way I grew up was like that. Yeah. You know, you see the kid and say, oh, he turned out that way. It's like, wait a minute, let's take a deeper look at the parents. Yeah. 
because they have to come from somewhere. Now, it means that maybe the kid decided to go on his own route and rebel against the parents. Yeah, and that happens. And that happens a lot. Yeah, yeah sure. But, uh, but still, you know, we have a responsibility that even when they make that decision, that we are men enough to stand up and say, okay, that's not acceptable. Just because it's my son, it's not acceptable. Uh, but not say, my son is a great man. Oh, I'm proud of my son. When you see him, you know, having pictures with little young girls, underage girls, yeah. taking drugs. And this is not slander because I've seen the pictures. Oh, yeah. You know, this is, and that's what concerns me. Um, I think that we, as believers in the Messiah and followers of the Torah, you said something that's very true. Now look at the person, look at the policies here. And we forget that Israel lived in Egypt. Babylon, Persia, Syria, all over the world, and everywhere they went, they prospered, and they made a difference. Whether they later, they later assimilated and then became like that nation, which was a problem, when that happened, they also got dispersed someplace else. Exactly. It seems like we're never going to break that cycle and until Messiah comes. Yeah, it, I, I mean, I've thought about it a lot, and, you know, history repeats itself, I say, and human nature never changes. Well, and right now, we know, I mean, God obviously redeems a person. And, yes. And you, I mean, I know that I'm not the same person I was before, you know, before I became a believer. But I mean, I have, you know, the struggles go on. But imagine if they were still held, held you accountable uh, for oh. what you did uh, yeah. when before you came became a believer. I would be completely ineffective. Right. So, why do we do that? with leaders who are trying to pass policies that actually are moral in nature. Because, you see, I've been teaching a lot about ritual purity and moral purity. And in the Bible, I noticed that the downfall of Israel was always when they became immoral right. as a nation. Right. That, was their, that was their Achilles heels. Yeah. That's the way the curse was able to come in. And that's the problem that's happening amongst believers is, is we are allowing political correctness because when a leader accepts and endorses or justifies abortions, well, we got a problem. And, and, and that's, I don't think you can get any closer to the heart of God than the life and value of, of, a, of an innocent baby. I agree. And so I, I guess I simply do not understand anywhere in my being how we can just cavalierly look at that and... I don't know. I hear you. It's just um, heartbreaking for, and especially because I see what's going on in my own home state, and and we're we're at an inflection point there. I personally, you know, New Mexico's at the bottom of the heap. Okay, mm -hmm. we're like fifty one, including Puerto Rico. In we have the most draconian um, public health orders. Still, ten months it's later, a fear people are walking yeah, around totally locked down. But it, it it's poor, and it's it's in this cycle of poverty and. When I look at it, I cannot help but think it's because we are the late-term abortion capital of the United States. Oppression. Exactly. Measure for measure. People don't realize that. It's a measure for measure principle in the Bible. Uh, you oppress the innocent, and the blood cries out. The blood's crying out. And, and if we cry out for justice, God will bring it. And he brings it through leaders. Right. That's the thing. We have the opportunity and well that's another conversation altogether oh my gosh. but let's not go there okay uh okay so one thing that is kind of funny i was watching this video they send it to me and there's people there's governmental people celebrating the new green whatever laws right so they have this new charger for cars and all that stuff so a reporter asked the lady okay so where's the grid where are you getting this energy from and the lady goes, oh, um, I'm not quite sure. And another person says, from coal. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So they're so stupid that they want to eliminate the the resource that allows them for them to use the, to charge the electric cars. And it's like, it makes no sense. We, well, do, do you know what they did in our state? No, I have so no clue. Uh, I live in a free state. I know, and I, I love it. Just I so you being, know. I love being here. Uh, so New Mexico passed a Green New Deal last year. And then after they passed the Green New Deal, the only state in the union to have one, they closed all the coal plants up in the northwest corner of the state. And then the new regime that came into office recently 
uh, basically is banning any kind of oil and gas leases on federal lands. Well, all of New Mexico's oil and gas leases are on federal land. Wow. So now we have no oil and gas, and they closed down the coal plants, and we're supposed to have this green energy, and it's inconsistent, and solar panels actually produce more toxicity than, you know, electricity or anything else. I mean, the absurdity of all of it. I think it's sad uh, when you try to be self-righteous and thinking that you're doing good without doing the research and you're trying to impose the view, you know, um, it leads to chaos because, again, we go back to the blueprint of creation. God created all things to have a function. Do I like to see an animal devour another animal of prey? No. But uh, when you see, um, incredible, I forgot to say in English, uh, 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 in English uh, they eat the dead animals. Carcass? Uh, yeah, they eat the carcasses. The birds that eat the yeah. carcasses. Yeah. Okay? And you, you look at it, it looks abhorrent to us, yeah. but that's God's that's way fine. he created in order for everything to recycle. Exactly. You know, it's, it's hard for us to understand it. Yeah. But you, you eliminate one of that cycle the order of or the things. order of, and you have chaos yeah. down the line. Yes, and it, I mean, and that's it. Chaos produces chaos. Even it never produces anything good. It's true. Even the, the, uh, the, the rivers, you change the way the they course, run. Yeah, yeah the, the course. In, the, in, in China, China, it happened. Yes. Um, in North Korea. Yeah. In North Korea, the guy changed it and created a famine for years. Yeah. Everything has its purpose. Everything yeah. has and order. And you mess up with the natural order that God has created. And so here we are. You start killing off the babies. I mean, the reason these politicians want all these illegals coming in is because we've just murdered over how many years now? 63 million people. That's a lot of people. That's So crazy. now we're at labor shortage, right? Yeah, young people don't want to work anymore. No, so now they're going to you know, flood the board. I mean... All of it has this consequential Consequence. thing, and the consequences are not good to create a healthy society. And really, God's, I think, I mean, the, the Bible really at its heart is to create a, an environment and a society that functions and is healthy for the blessing of everyone. Well, that's that's supposed to be our mandate. Yeah. We're supposed to defend the, in, uh, the innocent, yes. uh, defend the unborn, yeah. uh, defend the, the less fortunate help those people in need and um, put God on display by our behavior and also to instill our values, the values of God within our society and our communities. And we are definitely failing in all that. And that's why we're in trouble right now. And that's why we're changing the commandments. Many people are changing the commandments. They're changing the order of things. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sabbath doesn't start at night anymore. It starts in the daytime. Well, it makes no sense. If you understood ancient cosmology, you will know that God's message is, I have dominion over chaos darkness that's right. That's right. and i'm bringing light and you know that's got to be the heartbeat of our message the problem is that now by us changing the biblical uh commandments and doing it our way then how come we can complain about the government changes the order of life so it's we are in a way well. it's never going to end well so let me encourage you yes and all my audience <laughs> okay we need to encourage you yes. okay in the in the bible the prophets the prophets always ended with an encouragement now that i'm a prophet because they all die, but making sure. No matter what the world does, as long as we continue to believe and as long as we continue to walk and we can continue to put God on display based on our behavior and our character, He is bound by His oath and His promise to protect us and to guide us and to provide for us. So I want to encourage every single person out there who's listening. As we're having a conversation, we're just yeah, we're talking. Just, we have no notes. We're just nothing. Uh, we're just you know, talking. This is on our heart. This is something that I don't have much people, many people to talk with on this. So I'm glad you're here. So I want to encourage all of you to be engaged in your community. Yes. And not only your community um, of believers, but the community at large. And get to know people. Yes. Because, you know, my best conversations about kosher food is never with believers. It's always with people that ask me, man, you don't eat pork. Why? Yeah. And then I have an opportunity to present to them the Bible and also the science. Because they may not listen to the Bible. They'll listen to the science. Sure. And then when they accept the science, then they cannot disregard the Bible. I said, well, how would the guys in the Bible know how bad it was for you when science was not developing what we know now? And then they go like, I never thought about that. Yeah. So we have a great opportunity, folks, to, to make a difference 
it's not about a political personality. It's about the values and the policies that would represent us and represent the God we serve. So, Dina, thank you so much. Well, I just, to, to close, you know, God has planted you somewhere in a community with family and friends and whomever, and this is your time, you know, get off of the computer and the internet and all that and begin to build relationships in your community because you are going to need all of those people. And there is no telling what God can do when we rebuild all our, when we, when we rebuild relationships in community. Amen. No Amen. Thank you, Dina, for being with us, and thank you guys for joining us. It's always a pleasure. This is our WITCAST, and we're going to do our best to come back to you once in a while. It's been a while, but maybe we could do this a little bit more. Absolutely. Now I have to drive back to New Mexico. <laughs> All right. Go back to, to jail. <laughs> and go, go, go have your time out. All right. I'm here in free time, Florida, with a really good governor. Shalom, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.